Good morning. Good morning, all. Let's start the second day of the uh, workshop on new developmentalism. Uh, yesterday was great. Uh, I'm sure uh, today it's, it's going to be very profitable as well. Uh, before we start, uh, and before I read the disclaimer, uh, I just uh, forgot to thank Mateus Terentin yesterday, he, he talked with many of you, he helped a lot in the organization, so thank you, Mateus, a lot. Thank you, Jikon, uh, also for always helping us in the organizing event. And thank you, Fiona, for accepting our invitation. We are very happy to have you here. Uh, so uh, I have to read the disclaimer. Uh, all statements expressed by Fundação Getulio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represented their opinions and not necessarily FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone presented here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later in FGV official channels. Mm -hmm. To continue with these trans transmissions, we ask to, uh, that you express your agreement by verbalizing or signalizing our agreement. Uh, also, for those uh, watching uh, online, you can submit uh, questions to this webinar via Slido uh, uh, program. Uh, the link to participate is at the beginning of the description of the video. Also, I have to read the notice regarding image and voice recording. This event may collect our personal data and record our image and voice through photograph videos in accordance with the applicable laws. You have the option to reframe from participating. If you have any questions, please contact FGV through the data protection at portal.fgv.br. Uh, portal so let's go directly to the our main presentation. So uh, please, Fiona, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You have the... Uh, no, I don't have the... Where is it? Is it on? Is it? Is it okay? Uh, Th thanks, Tiago. Uh, it's me again. Um, uh, when I was uh, presenting uh, yesterday, it was at the end of the day. I think people yeah, were a bit tired after a long day. This morning, people have been out uh, celebrating, and uh, here we are. I'm the first one in the morning. Um, but, but hopefully, we'll, uh, the, the content will try to keep you awake. I changed the, the colors and so on to try and uh, make it a little bit uh, less boring from yesterday. Um, thank you. Um, so this morning I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the middle income trap, middle income technology trap. Um, it's a presentation which is combining uh, two papers with uh, co-authors. Uh, the first one with uh, my collaborator Antonio Andreoni, um, published uh, recently in Structural Change and Economic Dynamics. The second one is a, is a brand new paper, uh, it's just uh, completed, uh, not uh, submitted yet. Um, also with uh, Antonio and uh, Elvis and uh, Danilo over here. Um, so the first paper is a, is a conceptual and a theoretical paper with some case studies. And then the second one is an attempt to, to um, operationalize and uh, apply it uh, empirically. So earlier this year, Antonio and uh, Danilo came to Johannesburg and we worked together on this paper. Um, it's the first time we, uh, to be presenting the paper, so uh, also uh, interested to hear the feedback. And if I get some tricky questions uh, on the paper, I'll throw them to, to Danilo to answer. <laughs> yeah. So what we, what we tried to do uh, combined in, in, in these two papers uh, is that, it, well, in the first paper with uh, Antonio, we proposed this concept of a, a middle-income uh, technology trap. Um, and look at the, the, the specific um, structural configuration challenges uh, faced by, by countries uh, which are, are stuck in this. Um, and we explore some, some case studies of uh, China, Brazil, and, and, and uh, South Africa, uh, which I'll really just uh, touch on here. And then in the second, the new paper uh, in with, the, with the, the four authors, um, we, we undertake some uh, quantitative uh, empirical analysis um, to operationalize uh, the framework from the first paper. So we use factor analysis uh, to model the, the four dimensions that we've identified, uh, construct a new measure of the, of the middle income gap, um, and do some uh, regression analysis, which I'll be uh, presenting in a bit. 
Um, so look at this uh, concept of the, the middle income trap. Um, I think in choosing this topic and presenting here, it's, it's not to be uh, fixated on the concept of the trap and whether it is a trap or, 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 or not. Um, it's really looking at uh, structural change and uh, the catching up uh, process of uh, middle income countries. So we know that uh, yeah, middle income countries is a, is a large and heterogeneous uh, group of nations um, accounting for a you know, large proportion of the world's uh, population and uh, GDP and, and uh, even of the poor. Um, this concept of the middle income trap has been widely used but uh, probably um, under theorized and probably uh, misapplied uh, in, in a number of cases uh, or, and, or, or loosely applied. Um, and there are experiences of uh, developing countries uh, that, of course, have moved between income categories, have broken into middle income uh, status uh, or moved from uh, middle to, to high income status. Um, but as a stylized fact, most middle income countries have remained uh, stuck uh, in, in the middle. Um, so in some cases, uh, ha have broken into middle income status and then have uh, slowed down. Um, and I guess there are, there are debates uh, there, which uh, Professor Bresser and uh, Eliana and, and others have, have also written about as to, to what extent is this specific to middle income status or it's just things which happened during a particular period, uh, like liberalization and so on. We'll come back to that. Um, but I think in, in, in this paper, yeah, it's, it's not so much to become stuck in the concept of the trap, but it's really about structural change and catching up process of, uh, of uh, middle income countries. And empirically, no large middle income country um, has managed in the, in the past 15 years to graduate from middle income to, to high income status. Um, so it might not be a trap uh, in the definitive sense, but there, there is a, a, a tendency of, uh, of middle income countries becoming kind of stuck there. So just very briefly surveying uh, some of the literature on this, um, different bodies of literature. There's a number of papers that look at uh, kind of how to define the middle income trap and uh, em empirically how to operationalize it. Uh, a number of authors have looked at what are the kind of growth rates that are needed per capita in order to, uh, to close the gap um, and, and, and to graduate. Uh, a number of uh, authors look at uh, competitiveness issues, uh, some from a more neoclassical uh, perspective and looking at wage rates and so on, others looking in terms of uh, capabilities and, and uh, a, a broader perspective. Um, and then a kind of a third strand of the literature, I think, uh, you know, looking at uh, political economy and structural institutional framing, either at an individual country level or, or more collectively. Um, uh, some of the, the related to this literature on, uh, on causes. Uh, some of this looks at uh, failure to, to sustain sufficiently high rates of uh, labor productivity growth, lack of export competitiveness, uh, premature deindustrialization, which we talked about yesterday, uh, uh, liberalization, um, that is uh, as, uh, argued by uh, Professor Bresser and Eliana and, uh, and the, the co-author. Uh, in a number of cases, it's liberalization that happened in a particular period. So it's not re necessarily related to the middle income status, but a liberalization which happened there. Uh, the role of, of, of institutions. Um, I think uh, broadly, how we are using the concept of the, the middle income trap uh, in, in, this, in these papers is kind of in a loose way. Um, and it's to say that developing countries, maybe in the earlier stages of development and at a low income status, they can, they can get to a certain point by kind of capitalizing on the traditional advantages of being a low income country in terms of relatively low uh, unit labor costs and so on. And uh, it's not that low income countries don't need technological progress. They do need technological progress, but they can get to a certain point without having technological progress and innovation at the core of their development uh, trajectory. But at a certain point, you kind of run out of being able to exploit those, uh, those uh, ad advantages. It's not a, a, a fixed point that, okay, you, you break into the, uh, the World Bank's definition of middle income and then boom, uh, <laughs> the constraints uh, kick in. But it's at, at, I guess it's a more in, a, in an incremental way 
that some of those propel, propulsion from maybe the uh, relatively low unit labor cost and so on, you kind of run out of those advantages. And unless you then move into a more uh, uh, technology-based, uh, upgrading, uh, take forward structural transformation as we talked about yesterday, there's a tendency to, it's not a law, but there's a tendency to, to, to uh, stagnate. Um, yeah, just a, a couple of uh, kind of very broad uh, descriptives. This is just a very simple breakdown um, of the countries of the world um, as they're classified into the four uh, income uh, groups. Um, high income, low income, upper and, and uh, low and middle income uh, over 91 to 2022. So it's just breaking down the countries of the world by their, their classification. By number of countries. Just by number of countries, yeah. I've just put it as a percentage, but it's, it's simply number of countries, not uh, uh, world GDP or anything like that. And it's just to make a, a very simple point here, that these two together is, is basically the, the middle income countries of the world. And it's, it's pretty much uh, throughout this period accounting for uh, half of uh, the countries of the world. Do it kind of down a bit here. Yeah, of course, it's to some extent a function of how the thresholds are, 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 are defined. But as they are defined, roughly half of the, of, of the countries um, are, are falling into these two categories. Low income uh, falling and of course uh, high income growing as, as there is uh, some, some sort of uh, graduation. Um, here we are just uh, presenting some yeah, very simple descriptives um, of just a, a sample of uh, prominent uh, middle income countries, uh, Brazil, South Africa, uh, China, Russia, so it's the BRICS countries as, as well as uh, Turkey. Um, and this, uh, this heavy line here is the, is the high income uh, threshold, uh, which is, is, is separating in the, in the official classifications, uh, middle and, and, and high income. Um, and of course, that threshold is, is itself uh, rising over time. Um, so it's just uh, showing here that of this uh, selective group of, of, of countries, over this period, uh, what was this, uh, to about uh, 2010 or roughly or so, there's some convergence. You see the countries mostly kind of closing a bit towards the, the high income uh, threshold. Um, of these, uh, yeah, Russia briefly uh, surpassed the threshold uh, was a couple of years classified as a high income country during the commodity boom, but wasn't able to sustain that. Uh, it's gone back into uh, uh, middle income status. Um, Brazil nearly, <laughs> ne ne nearly did it, yeah, touch there again. This is the period of the commodity boom, right? So these are, uh, we can see during this uh, commodity boom period, uh, yeah, Brazil and, and even uh, Turkey, uh, almost crossed, but after commodity boom, uh, yeah, we have gone further. Of, of course, the, the only exception is, is, is China, um, which starts in a completely different uh, league from the other three countries. You can see here Brazil, uh, South Africa, Turkey in a similar ballpark, China down there. And whilst the rest of us are going up and down, of, of course, uh, we know the story of, uh, of China. And very soon it will be a high income country, just within a few years. Yeah. Of course, everybody knows uh, the story of China as a, as, as a high-growing country. Every, everybody knows this. But I feel, it, I don't know whether in Brazil, but at least in South Africa, people haven't really internalized the, the levels and just how far, how far ahead China is. <laughs> Everyone knows China grew fast, right? Or, and it's growing fast. But if you ask uh, people, even economists, somehow people haven't internalized that the average Chinese person is uh, so much richer than the average uh, South African person. I don't know whether in Brazil people, how, how people will, uh, will, will look at this. Yeah? I think people generally think, okay, China's growing fast, it's catching up. But I mean, you know, uh, this is your, your, your GNI uh, per capita now. I mean, China's up there, uh, here's uh, uh, Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, such a huge gap. Yeah. Um, so here it, it's, um, in fact, it's basically the same chart. I'm just uh, presenting it in a different way to uh, preempt some of the empirical analysis uh, that I'll come to, to, to later. Um, so this is the, the, the concept that we have developed around the uh, uh, middle income gap. Um, so it's, I mean, I will present it in, a, in an equation uh, later, but it's just a simple concept. 
um, is, is basically the, um, the, the difference between uh, the high income threshold and the country's uh, income per capita divided by the, the threshold, so as a, as a, as a ratio. Um, so of course, if, if it goes to zero, you've closed the gap, right? So as, as we see here, it's almost a, a mirror image, but it presented a bit differently. This was the period where, where Russia became a, a high-income country. So where the gap is negative, uh, you, you have crossed to, to the high-income threshold. And again, I mean, obviously we're seeing the same trend because it's based on the same. China is obviously uh, closing, closing that gap. Um, here is yeah, presenting something a, l a little bit uh, similar, but uh, the three countries, uh, Brazil, uh, South Africa, China in this case. Um, here uh, presenting also uh, in, in the solid lines, uh, GNI per capita. Um, so in the, in the, in the, yeah, in, in the, uh, no, no, okay. It basically, it, it's, it's presenting GNI per capita and uh, manufacturing uh, value added per capita. So it's also the, the relative levels of uh, in industrialization, of course, on the, on the, the different axes. Um, so here we are bringing in the, the trends in terms of industrialization and uh, by implication, uh, structural change and so on. So again, uh, as we see in China, uh, as well known, the growth story, but also uh, the story of industrialization. And in fact, uh, you know, even though they're on different axes, but we can see the, if anything, the slope is uh, steeper of uh, manufacturing uh, a value added, showing the, the industrialization uh, story there. Um, uh, as, and uh, as if, you, if we look, for example, here, South Africa and Brazil in the beginning of the period, uh, not only being richer, but of course, the much higher manufacturing uh, value added uh, per capita um, compared to China. As we were saying, uh, uh, Professor Bresser, even uh, when we were having dinner uh, on, uh, when was it, on, on, on uh, Thursday, that uh, for all of the, the problems of uh, Brazil in terms of uh, stagnation and deindustrialization and even inequality and so on, if you're comparing Brazil to, to, to China, it looks like a disaster. But if you compare it to South Africa, uh, <laughs> uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil looks a bit, uh, a bit better, yeah. So coming to this concept of the, the middle income uh, technology uh, trap, um, which uh, myself and Antonio proposed in the, in the, in the 2020 uh, SCED paper, um, I'll flesh it out a bit more in the course of the presentation, but it's basically the structural and uh, institutional configurations found in uh, middle income countries that are not conducive to increasing um, domestic value um, addition and to sustained uh, industrial and technological upgrading um, in middle income countries. So it's combining, uh, I guess, concepts of um, upgrading and technological progress with uh, industrialization and, uh, and uh, the catching up. So we, we identify um, four uh, key uh, dimensions of this or, or challenges uh, facing uh, countries as part of this uh, middle income uh, technology trap. Um, and I'll come into them in, in a bit more detail. Um, so it's breaking into the global economy and more specifically breaking into uh, global industrial production in, in a substantial sense. And then the two related challenges in terms of the strategic integration with global value chains. Uh, even in my presentation yesterday, we talked a, a, a bit about uh, the risks of uh, getting stuck in those low value added uh, parts of the global value chains. So it's about linking up with global value chains um, as well as linking back with uh, the domestic economy, with uh, local production systems and then keeping pace uh, with, uh, with the technological change. So these are the four key challenges, which I'll uh, talk a bit about uh, now, and then when we come to the econometrics, uh, we will try to, to model these. Um, so the first challenge, um, breaking into the global economy. Uh, so here we're looking at the concentration, the compression, and the reconfiguration of uh, manufacturing production uh, globally. Um, so here it's, it's just showing some trends in terms of uh, the, the global composition um, of uh, manufacturing uh, production. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, this is using the TIVA data, the, the, the previous iteration. Uh, so it's only going up to, to uh, 2011 here. Um, so what we're plotting here is uh, two groups of countries. Um, firstly, the, the G7 
which are these two lines here. Uh, so this is uh, the solid line here is, is their share of global manufacturing production, uh, which I'm going to focus more on. And then the, the, the dashed line is in terms of value. Um, and then the, the, these bottom two lines is the others in the top 16 manufacturing nations. Okay, so it's the the top 16 um, minus uh, the, the, the G7. Yeah. So together, uh, these are the are, are basically your top uh, 16 uh, manufacturing nations of the world. So at the beginning of the of this period in, in 1995. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, 16 minus, yeah. Six, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's including, for example, China, uh, India, and uh, Brazil is, is, is here as well. Um, so at the beginning of this period, uh, we can see this extraordinarily high share of global manufacturing production. I guess it's about 65%, just done by seven countries of the, of the world. And in fact, of, of the seven, I think at this point, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Japan and, and US, just between those two, was having about 40% or so, just the two countries. And then uh, Germany and a couple of others having other significant percentages and so on. So, so the first uh, observation here is just the, the, what's been called in some literature the gate convergence. Right? Um, if we look at the two uh, solid lines, uh, the convergence between these. So there's an element of, of uh, catching up here amongst this uh, second tier of uh, manufacturing nations, but it's, 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 it's basically mainly a, a story of China, <laughs> right? That even at this stage, 95, not that long ago, less than 20 years ago, uh, Chinese manufacturing production was still so underdeveloped compared to now. So a large part of this, of, of this convergence uh, is, is a story of China, but there has still been some, uh, some, some catching up. So even Brazil, for example, um, in the period of the 2000s, uh, there was an element of uh, catching up in terms of uh, in, in industrial production. Um, so it's a convergence, but there's also a concentration even within this other 16. And then even countries like South Africa still, uh, despite you know, having some history as an industrializing nation, it's, just, you know, it's not a low-income country which is trying to uh, knock at the door of industrialization and it's got a long industrial history, but still playing a very marginal role in terms of uh, global manufacturing uh, production. Uh, okay, I think I'll skip this one because of time. So basically the challenge of breaking in is that um, uh, even today, and this is after, what now, about uh, half a century of deindustrialization in the advanced uh, economies of the world, right? I mean, we think about the Rust Belt in the US and so on. Uh, after almost this, this uh, yeah, it's more than half a century of, of deindustrialization now. Still, they're accounting for for significant shares of, of of manufacturing production. I mean, one lesson from that is that uh, manufacturing is not a dead end, right? <laughs> because even after this half century of, of deindustrialization, still so much manufacturing is happening in uh, Europe and the US and so on. Um, but that global industrial production remains highly concentrated. Um, a small group of countries um, have managed to break in, but even that group is mainly in East Asia and uh, is highly concentrated uh, within that. Um, and if we look at a similar chart in, in terms of uh, medium and high-tech manufacturing, the trends, of course, are, is, is even more pronounced. So some of the, the, the barriers to breaking in include uh, realizing global scale economies, um, intellectual property rights, uh, institutions and capabilities for technological development and uh, innovation. These are not new, but I think some of them have become more pronounced over time, particularly in terms of um, IPRs. Um, and they are not necessarily specific to middle-income countries, but I think the third one there, it, it's more of a binding constraint on middle than on uh, lower-income countries. Like, as I was saying earlier, you can kind of, as a low-income country, you can kind of get further, uh, or you can get to a point uh, without, uh, without making as much progress with that as you would need to go from middle to high-income uh, status. So, the, yeah, we talked a bit yesterday about uh, what I call the China squeeze. The success of China, it, it brings um, opportunities and challenges for other uh, middle-income countries. Um, so, of course, uh, manufacturing in many middle-income countries is affected by um, import penetration from China, but it also opens opportunities for integration in, in terms of global value chains and so on. It's uh, something which uh, myself and Danilo and another co-author is exploring in a, a paper in progress, actually. 
Um, so I'll look together at uh, the two challenges, uh, the second and third, looking at uh, the nature of uh, integration with uh, global value chains. Um, so I think uh, here probably everybody is, uh, is familiar with this kind of, it's, it's called the, uh, the, the smile curve here, uh, from different phases um, of, uh, of value chains, R&D, design, supply management, uh, production, logistics, uh, uh, services, and so on. Um, and that uh, we, we basically have this uh, U-shaped type of curve. So the kind of uh, value addition is, uh, is highest and, and profitability as well is highest at the two ends, right? So um, typically your uh, developing countries uh, production in global value chains will be uh, located more in the middle here, uh, the production part and especially the uh, assembly part where there's the least uh, value addition, the least profitability, the least uh, opportunities for, for upgrading and so on. And a lot of even the wins from that are, are captured by, by uh, lead firms. So to bring in the concept of um, upgrading and the, the different dimensions of that uh, within uh, value chains, we're really thinking here in terms of uh, the ability of a firm or an economy to move towards more profitable, uh, more technologically sophisticated, uh, more capital and skills intensive types of activities um, with higher uh, uh, value creation potential and to capture more of the value created uh, through those. Um, and of course there are different types of, uh, uh, um, of, of this upgrading. Um, product upgrading, so moving into more sophisticated uh, product lines. Um, uh, process upgrading, um, uh, functional upgrading, so performing uh, more advanced functions uh, within value chains. So, so here, for example, a movement uh, from an assembly stage to the design stage uh, would be part of the functional upgrading um, or in intersectoral um, upgrading. So moving, uh, moving between value chains um, into more, uh, more advanced industries which are related, but more, more advanced. Yeah, so of course there's, there's a whole literature on, on these different types of um, upgrading. Um, so in, in, in combining these two uh, challenges, what we call the second and third challenges, so it's about linking up with uh, global value chains whilst also linking back. So it's about the nature of, of, of uh, integration. Um, and I think building on some of the arguments which I was introducing yesterday about the danger of getting stuck in those low value added uh, parts of the value chain so that the stepping stone becomes a, instead of becoming a stepping stone to something else, it becomes the step that you, you, you end on. Um, so producing in the, the lowest value added parts of the, of the global value chain doesn't automatically um, lead to the upgrading of uh, domestic uh, technological capabilities. And of course, moving into the, in, any of these types of upgrading that we talked about, functional, process, product, and so on, um, is, is not easy. Um, the, the more desirable parts of the value chains have higher capabilities uh, thresholds, which uh, firms need to, to move into. So part of this is about the upgrading within value chains. And then part of it is, is, is also about the nature of integration between the production, which is in those value chains, and the rest of the domestic economy. So there's the risk of, of these becoming kind of enclaves. Uh, I mean, the most extreme being the kind of Makila model. Um, but even if it's not in a, like an EPZ, uh, even if it's not spatially segregated, but it can be functionally se se uh, segregated from the rest of a domestic economy. And again, this comes back to some of the, the, the concepts which I was uh, talking about yesterday about how that kind of unstrategic integration within global value chains can potentially weaken the growth pulling potential of uh, manufacturing and that traditional uh, structuralist uh, view of, of manufacturing as an engine of growth. Um, because if a uh, firm, uh, let's say in the developing economy, is just importing uh, the intermediate goods, performing their function of assembly or whatever, and it's exported to the next uh, stage of the, of the GVC, you don't have those backward linkages, uh, which is a key component of manufacturing as an, as an engine of, uh, of growth. So you can have this uh, linking up while delinking uh, uh, domestically and even um, hollowing out uh, domestic manufacturing. Again, it's not an inevitability, an inevitability. it's not to say that uh, GVC integration is bad, but it's about how and that strategic integration. 
So part of this is about uh, linking back to local producers and local supply chains, uh, local production system development and so on. And it's not just about uh, supply linkages. Uh, it's about uh, technological spillovers and so on, uh, skills spillovers. Um, so part of those potential benefits, yes, it's about sourcing supplies domestically and having those multiply effects, but also about uh, learning effects and so on uh, to allow uh, manufacturing to play that, that uh, broader role. Um, yeah, and, and so I, I think, uh, you yeah, looking empirically, uh, some of the weaknesses in, in many uh, middle income and uh, developing countries um, of uh, domestic supply chains, um, local innovation systems and so on, have been some of those challenges in terms of uh, linking up uh, while linking back. Um, th the fourth challenge, and of course all of these are, are, are closely related, they're not uh, separate in practice, is about keeping pace uh, with technological change. Um, so here, uh, I, I hope is a, is a bit visible, don't worry about all of the details. Here we're using this concept of uh, technological uh, readiness levels from the uh, TRL uh, literature. Um, Okay, thanks. Um, so basic uh, technology research, uh, research to prove the feasibility, technology development, technology demonstration, subsystem development, system launch. Uh, I mean, of course, it's, it's not linear for all types of uh, technologies and practice in different sectors and so on, but from the, the literature, I mean, it's, it's, it's the broad uh, stages of uh, the development and deployment of, of technologies. So broadly, it's about uh, research, the kind of concept and uh, uh, early technology development, um, deployment and, and operationalization. So in terms of the, the kind of institutional aspects of this, uh, we typically find uh, the state uh, being more strongly involved uh, in these earlier stages through the university system, uh, uh, public research uh, organizations and so on uh, typically come in here and the private sector typically uh, at these later stages we you're actually having the, the, the testing and the deployment and the opera operationalization of, of those technologies um, so in, in the literature and it's not us but uh, this gap has been uh, identified um, in in the uh, technological development and, and upgrading process um, and this includes even, in, in, in many cases in developing countries, it's not just about uh, kind of brand new innovations that are new to the world and making inventions and patents and so on. It's also about taking technologies out there, even from uh, uh, internationally and uh, adapting and, de and uh, deploying them. So even there, some of, uh, it might not be R&D, but it's still it's about some kind of uh, uh, technological process. Um, so, so linking this with the uh, concept of uh, keeping pace, uh, this has been called uh, the value of death <laughs> in the uh, technology literature, this kind of gap. Um, and, and we can see it in practice in uh, even uh, in many developing countries, uh, I think to a greater extent than in the advanced economies, um, where you've got research being done in universities and science councils and so on, You've got firms which are wanting to improve their technology and they have their own R&D departments and so on. Uh, but those kind of innovation ecosystems and technological processes, there's often a, a, a gap there, which is called in the literature the kind of the value of, uh, of death. And then part of the keeping pace challenge um, in developing countries in particular is that there's also a, a, a vertical gap. So the, um, here, for example, because uh, in developing countries, like the kind of basic science research is at lower levels than in advanced economies and so on. So this curve, instead of being up here, will be, will be down here. And similarly, even at the firm level, um, because of resources and skills and capabilities, there's also a vertical uh, gap there. So the, the challenge of keeping pace, if we can think of it graphically, it's, it's about this gap in the middle, as well as the kind of uh, vertical uh, gaps here. Um, okay, I think it's a, this is the, the basically the concept I was trying to explain. So 
it, the red is, is almost like portraying this figuratively in uh, developing countries. So the curve, which could be there, is, is, is down there, as, as well as uh, uh, yeah, the horizontal and the, and the vertical gap. Um, so to come to the, uh, the three case studies uh, that we explore in the paper, um, the Inno Fund in, in, in China, Embrapa here in Brazil, and the uh, Manufacturing Competitiveness uh, Program in, in, in South Africa. Um, these are all interventions kind of uh, geared at least in part towards um, keeping pace with uh, technological change and upgrading and so on, which are targeted at, at different stages um, of this uh, process. Um, the Inno Fund in China, largely at this early stage. Um, um, Embrapa, to some extent, uh, I think uh, playing this kind of bridging role uh, of, the, of the in the in the valley of death, um, and the MCEP in South Africa at at, at this later stage. So in, in the case of the Inno Fund in, in China, um, it's kind of trying to lift that up, and similarly in the MCO, MCEP. So we chose these three case studies um, as kind of different stages uh, in in this. Um, and in, in the choice of these uh, case studies. Um, even though earlier I was showing, of course, the, uh, the stellar performance of, of China, uh, Brazil further down, and uh, South Africa even, even lower, uh, the, the case studies are not to show, okay, here was an amazing success story of China, and here's a failure in, in, in South Africa. These are all programs which had uh, successes. So it's not, to sh it's not uh, trying to uh, uh, explain those different outcomes in terms of these, but there are three, three, three interesting uh, case studies which all had a, a positive impact in different ways. Um, so although, yeah, uh, as I said, in China we have had uh, industrialization, dynamic growth, Brazil and South Africa, deindustrialization and, and uh, stagnation, um, but here we look at these three interventions. So in the case of China, no fund and innovation funding model, um, in uh, uh, Brazil, um, an intermediate uh, technology institutions uh, model is the, the case of Embrapa, and in South Africa, the matching grant uh, commercialization uh, model. So in the, the, the SCED paper, we have some uh, pages of uh, details about these uh, case studies. I'm just going to talk about them uh, very briefly uh, here. Um, so, so China, uh, in, in terms of the, the Inno Fund, um, I guess it, it fits in with a broader uh, history of uh, since the late 1980s, with a growing emphasis on uh, uh, technological development as part of uh, China's industrialization path. So as early as 1986, China adopted this national high-tech uh, development plan. China was still a really poor country <laughs> at, at, at that point, poorer than uh, many African countries even today. Um, and uh, yeah, so for example, there was that torch program um, from 1988, targeted in hybrid finance uh, to support uh, technological innovation. Um, so I think it's important even to look, uh, before I come to InnoFund, to, to this kind of history, going back, as I say, even to the late uh, 80s, and even before much of the liberalization um, happened in China, to these deliberate state-led efforts at uh, upgrading. So a lot of the, the kind of the mainstream uh, story of uh, Chinese growth, because of course even the mainstream has to have its own story, right? It will just be that, okay, there was liberalization. <laughs> the state stood back the market uh, took off, and then there was the Chinese uh, growth miracle. Um, but it, as I say here, even going back to the 1980s, uh, where it was still a you know, very uh, strongly state-directed uh, uh, economy, even to more extent, and a, a poor country, you know, a poor low-income low country, poorer than many African countries today, as I say, was putting in place these measures for high-tech manufacturing. Uh, and it's not by, it's not by chance that today we see China as the leading uh, role in terms of AI, <laughs> robots, and, uh, and, and advanced uh, frontier technologies, right? Um, so it's about those investments that were made and were followed through. Uh, unlike in many of our countries, we might have a policy, it's written on paper, you can see it, you can download it off the internet, <laughs> but it's not always uh, implemented. So in the case of uh, this, this particular case study that we look at, the, the Inno Fund, this came a bit later, 1999, uh, aimed at uh, facilitating and encouraging um, the innovation activities of, of uh, small and medium technology-based enterprises and commercializing research. So it's basically a funding model 
um, aimed at leveraging funding to upscale and commercialize uh, innovations and uh, apply them in, in the businesses. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We've got uh, much more in the paper. Uh, we've got clear eligibility uh, criteria, which were strictly enforced. So it's not just like uh, handouts depending on who you know or whatever. It's about complying with national um, industrial, uh, industrial policy and technology policies, um, high potential for, for, for impact, um, competitiveness. Uh, there was strict criteria in terms of the types of companies. Um, so uh, you know, in, in less than 500 employees, for us, it doesn't sound so uh, small or medium, but I guess in the, in the case of China, it, it, it was. Um, and 30% of the employees of these companies must have received higher education. Remember, this is in 1999, uh, so it was still, no, you know, we're talking about a China which wasn't uh, as, as well off as, as today. So that's one way of targeting. You know, it's quite difficult to say, okay, we want to target high tech companies. How do you measure it? Uh, so I guess this was one of the kind of criteria because you, you can produce the proof. Either your, your staff 30% have higher education or, the, or, or they don't have, right? Um, uh, or in the investment in the companies, so ensuring that uh, you, you're having that kind of upgrading, so, uh, that the, the finance is not just kind of uh, lining someone's pocket, but the fi it's, a, it's what we could call rent management, right? Ensuring that there's a R&D um, proven degree of innovativeness and so on. They provided different types of uh, finance, uh, startup capital for, for commercializing innovations, partial subsidies and interest-free loans for, for innovation by these uh, companies, um, and minority equity investment for, for advanced uh, technologies. So it's basically a financing model for firm level um, innovation. Um, in the case of Embrapa, I feel a little bit uh, shy to <laughs> talk about a uh, Brazilian case with a Brazilian uh, audience, uh, but anyway, feel free to make uh, your corrections or whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, for those on online might not uh, have uh, as much uh, background. Uh, so Embrapa founded in 1972, um, partially to address some of the, the weaknesses of uh, uh, DNPEA uh, in terms of you know, the lack of skills, some of institutional weaknesses and so on. And basically it's a network of um, intermediate uh, technology institutes uh, in, this, uh, in, in this sector, which have fostered uh, technological change, uh, diversification, upgrading in uh, farming, agriculture, and uh, agro-processing. And uh, institutes in this network needed to develop both uh, generic technologies um, as well as uh, product-specific technology, um, had to invest in the acquisition of uh, what we call infra technologies, such as testing facilities, uh, metrology and data systems, um, which are necessary as, as part of that uh, process of technology development, that TRL, right? Uh, so it's not just enough to do research and hope that uh, it will find its way in, 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 into firms, right? So remember in, in, in those charts which I was having earlier that we kind of locate Embrapa as that bridging between the, the early and the later stages of uh, technological uh, readiness, um, which helps to, to kind of convert the initial research into something which is usable um, in, 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 in firms. Um, so it's investment uh, or facilitated supported investments at the interface of agriculture, biotechnologies, and advanced manufacturing. So I think part of the reason why we also chose this, this uh, case study uh, not just because of it plays that kind of bridging role in, in that uh, technological readiness, but also it's interesting to look at things in, in the agro-processing uh, uh, sphere of, uh, of manufacturing. Because I think especially for many developing countries, it's one of the, the kind of uh, viable pathways uh, towards uh, industrialization. Of course, it can't end there, but it's one of the viable routes even for, for, for low-income countries. So there's just some examples here. I'm not going to, to go through all of them. Um, in terms of some of those uh, roles, quality improvement in uh, meat production chain, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, coming to the case of uh, uh, South Africa, so here we look at this case study of this program called uh, Manufacturing Competitiveness um, Enhancement uh, Program, uh, which ran for five years from uh, 2012 to, to 2017. Um, and it's, it's really a, a uh, financing uh, instrument of, of uh, industrial policy, um, which provided kind of matching finance uh, for firm level um, innovation um, and uh, upgrading. Um, 
had some sectoral focus in terms of agro-processing, uh, metals and, uh, and, and chemicals, uh, although also covered uh, a, a bit more broadly within uh, industrial policy with, or within in industrial sectors. Um, ha had some good impact, but one of the problems was maybe a lack of coordination. Um, in South African industrial policy landscape, there are many different types of incentives. In fact, even firms that don't know uh, they say they don't know what are all of the incentives are out there, and sometimes they are not. They're done by different agencies. They are not coordinated, and, and 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 so on. So there's also been questions in relation to this about what is the kind of additionality, like how much did it actually uh, facilitate upgrading or uh, expanded production that wouldn't uh, otherwise uh, have have happened. Um, so so looking at these uh, three cases together. It's not necessary to compare them directly because they're just different types of instruments, but they're just kind of uh, case studies. Um, I think in the China case, it underscores the importance of, uh, of, of long-term commitment. So th this inner fund was not something that, uh, like in some developing countries, implemented and then a new government comes in and then it's changed or whatever. Of course, in, in, in uh, China, uh, <laughs> you don't have those uh, electoral cycle in the, in the, in the same way as, uh, as, as other countries. Uh, we, we, uh, yeah, um, but w one implication of that is, is the kind of stability and the consistency um, of uh, in, in industrial policy, right? That even firms would know that if we make investments, we're going to continue getting uh, th that support. Um, in the, the Brazil case, I think it's, it's interesting in terms of the importance of um, public technology um, intermediaries <coughs> to support uh, you know, those middle stages, uh, the absorption, the adaptation, and the diffusion of um, technologies but, you know, in, in those intermediate uh, stages of uh, technological readiness. Um, in the South Africa case, even though it had mixed results, but kind of highlights the importance of um, boosting technology, uh, technology deployment and production operations, um, especially in a, in a developing country context where um, basic, uh, basic science and research is, 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 is at pretty low levels um, and where the private sector is, is also n not doing uh, much in terms of uh, well, R&D and innovation, but even just in terms of basic in investment and capital <coughs> upgrading and so on. So it, it, it provides some at, at least example in terms of uh, uh, how, how to enhance that within an industrial policy in instrument. So, so these three case studies, uh, they illustrate the diversity of ways in which uh, middle-income countries um, have attempted to, to, to meet some of these challenges um, of upgrading and industrialization. Um, I mean, it's not written in the policy, or this is how we all want to escape from a, a middle-income trap, but it's basically trying to be uh, policies which are aimed at industrialization, um, at upgrading, um, at yeah, trying to move into um, uh, com competitiveness and so on. So all have degrees of uh, successes and failures, um, uh, but yeah, heterogeneity in the, in the specific uh, policy and, and institutional design. And I think broadly we could classify them, um, yeah, the inner, inner fund in, in, in China and the MCEP in South Africa as kind of the, the finance-based industrial policy instruments. It's not to say that uh, this is characterizing the industrial policy landscape in these countries uh, altogether, but it's these specific instruments. The, so, the, so these ones, the, the Inner Fund and the MCEP, at different stages of, of that technological readiness program, but both, both mainly based on uh, financial incentives uh, and monetary transfers. Um, and then the Mbrapa case, uh, more based on the provision of uh, technological and uh, industrial services. Um, I think in, in all cases, uh, well, and it goes to industrial policy more broadly, there are always challenges in designing um, policies that are feasible and, and, and enforceable, right? Um, and again, it comes to one size, no one size fits all. Because if it was that easy, we could just take an industrial policy uh, document from China uh, you use the Google Translate that you were talking about earlier, Professor Breza, uh, adopt it, <laughs> and uh, boom, there we go. Of course, it's, it's, it's not so easy. Um, so it's about designing policies that are fit for purpose and enforceable, right, uh, with the different political economies and skill sets and so on. Um, so in the case of China, it highlights the importance of um, embedding the principles of uh, enforcement in the early stages of policy design. 
using this mixture of, uh, of, of carrots and sticks, um, of different types of support and so on. Um, yeah, in, in South African case, as I mentioned, uh, the, the challenges in terms of kind of institutionally managing where does this fit in, in the industrial policy uh, landscape, a lack of coherence and so on. Um, I think I didn't make a, a final comment here on, on uh, uh, Wiesel. I will leave it to yourselves. Um, so obviously there's different kind of political economies and institutional settings in, 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 the, in the three, particularly Brazil and uh, South Africa as compared to China. Um, but in all three, there are different modes of uh, articulation between the state and the private sector. So even in terms of the Chinese uh, case, obviously a much stronger role for the state, but this model is based on uh, the private sector, right? It's based on encouraging support, uh, encouraging <coughs> innovation um, in the private sector. So it's about uh, that continuous dialogue and exchange of um, information, but at the same time retaining autonomy for the state. So the state being sufficiently uh, clued up about what's happening in, in the private sector, but maintaining that autonomy to discipline uh, capital rather than uh, being captured uh, by capital. Um, okay, so I'm going to move now to the, the, the next part and, and the last part of the uh, presentation. Um, which is uh, you know, drawing on uh, the, the new paper that uh, we, have, uh, we have just produced. Um, so here we, we're taking this concept of the, the middle income uh, technology trap, uh, which we developed uh, conceptually in the first paper and, and uh, trying to apply it uh, in, empirically. So what are the determinants of closing uh, the middle income gap? So it's an empirical analysis um, covering 54 countries um, over this period, uh, 95 to 2016. Of course, we would have liked to have done it for longer, but uh, as we all know, uh, data constraints. Um, so, and so basically we're covering here um, all non-high income uh, countries. So our, our, our country sample is any countries um, that were below the high income level um, at any point um, in this period. Yeah. So the only countries basically excluded are countries which were high income uh, throughout the period and um, uh, never uh, middle income. But we have two uh, variations on the sample, um, which I'll come to when I, when I present the results. Uh, so our broader sample um, is all countries, uh, as I said, that were, were middle, um, middle or lower income actually at any point in the, in, in the period. Um, and we include all of the observations. So even a country like a, as I so the high, you, you said you said the high income to last the test. Or so so th th this is the difference uh, which I will explain between one and two. So the broader sample uh, is, is any countries uh, that were uh, basically that were not high income throughout. Then we include all of the observations. So for example, uh, when I was showing the charts earlier, we saw the case of Russia. Sometimes it dipped into high income uh, status. Uh, it's, it's, it's still part of that, uh, the, the broader sample, right? Because it was, uh, it was middle income at least, uh, or, or part of it. Um, and for this one, uh, we, we use a, a normalized uh, measure of our middle income gap, which I will come to. And then the, our second uh, country sample is a bit restricted. It's o it excludes those observations where a country uh, went into high income status. Um, so it only includes those individual years. So for example, take that case of, uh, of Russia, it will exclude those years when it dipped into high income uh, status. Um, and in this case, we don't even uh, need to normalize. So we have these two small uh, variations on the sample also just to test the, the robustness um, and run some uh, panel econometrics. So earlier when I was uh, showing those, uh, th those descriptive charts, um, I gave a kind of intuitive explanation of uh, this concept of the middle income gap. Um, so, but uh, uh, yeah, basically, so just a simple measure. Um, it's the, the, the in a way, you, your distance from the high income uh, threshold divided by the threshold, right? So it's uh, a country's uh, GNI at any point in time. How far is that from uh, the high income threshold, as a percentage of, of that uh, of that threshold, right? So if you are if you meet that if you have closed the gap, and you've hit the high income threshold then the, your middle income gap is, uh, is, is zero. So obviously the bigger the gap, the further you are from the, uh, the, the high income threshold and uh, uh, you know, the, the higher the, the, the value. Um, so where your middle income gap is, is closing over time is basically the concept of catching up. Um, 
And then, as I say, for our, our, our broader sample, um, where we include uh, those observations, even where countries uh, dipped into the, the high income status, uh, then for that one, we need to normalize uh, the middle income gap. To, otherwise, it's going to go into negative uh, uh, values when you cross the, the threshold. So for this, uh, where we have the wider sample, including the high income observations, uh, we normalize it uh, between uh, zero and one. Um, so earlier I talked about the, the, the four kind of dimensions or the four challenges of, uh, of, of catching up. Um, the breaking in, linking up, uh, linking back, and, uh, and uh, keeping pace. So basically we, we identify some uh, variables to model each of these four uh, dimensions, um, and we use uh, factor analysis to synthesize and combine them into indices uh, representing each of the, of the dimensions. So this is uh, showing the, the variables that we use for each of these uh, dimensions. Um, so for example, uh, breaking in is uh, manufacturing uh, value added as a share of, uh, of, of uh, GDP, a measure of human capital, um, export share and so on. Uh, I, I won't go through, through, through each of them here. Um, of course, uh, as anyone doing empirical work knows that you, you're constrained by data availability. Uh, we started with a long list of uh, variables we would have liked to have included for keeping pace, patents, uh, research personnel as a percentage of the workforce, R&D spending, and so on. But to include all of these, you end up with uh, almost no observations because we're talking here about uh, developing countries. Um, so we had to balance, in a way, the selection of variables uh, with, uh, with, with uh, data avail availability. Uh, these uh, global value chain measures here is based on the, on the, on the TIVA data for, for uh, linking up and, uh, and linking back. So in our econometric analysis, um, first of all, we, use a, we run a factor analysis to combine each of these into a measure for breaking in, uh, these ones into a measure for linking up and so on. Um, and we, then we model uh, regressions with those as the four explanatory variables. And then we also run it with these uh, variables as individual uh, explanatory variables. Um, yeah, so our, our baseline specification, the dependent variable is, uh, is the, the, the middle income gap, uh, that, uh, that ratio which I've uh, already explained. Um, uh, and basically our expansion variables are these uh, uh, vector measuring these dimensions. So in, in the one version with the four uh, dimensions um, and then uh, separately with the each of the individual um, explanatory variables. Um, and a, a, a negative um, estimated coefficient um, is basically is saying that that variable contributes positively to closing the gap, right? Because it means if that variable is going up, your gap is going down. So basically we expect a negative coefficient is, is saying that it's, a, it's, it's helping to close the gap, right? So I'm just going to present uh, two tables of uh, results here. Um, so here is where we have got our, our four... Uh, um, uh, dimensions, uh, breaking in, linking up, linking back, and, uh, and uh, keeping pace. Um, and we've got our two uh, samples here. So uh, this is with our, our, our complete sample. So including those ones where, like that Russia case, where they break into uh, high income and go back, it's included there. Um, and the normalized measure, here are slightly restricted samples. So you'll see even in terms of the, the number of observations. Uh, we've got just over a thousand and a bit less in the in the restricted sample. Um, so basically, the the key take home uh, here um, is that you know, broadly we are seeing uh, between these results more or less as expected. Uh, the negative coefficients, a few uh, missing here. The linking back, uh, this one is not significant, and, and uh, this one for breaking in. But broadly, we are seeing the the kind of negative uh, coefficients as we expect. Um, here where we have included the different uh, variables individually, because of space I've just put uh, p-values and things are a, a bit smaller here. Um, so here we see a, a bit of a mixed picture, but broadly the kind of negative and uh, significant coefficients uh, that we expect. Um, looking at our manufacturing uh, variables here, this, so this is um, MVA, manufacturing value added per capita. Uh, and this one is the uh, manufacturing share of, uh, of GDP. It looks like the two might be kind of fighting each other, but for, for, for significance, uh, here we see this one uh, significant here and this one, but broadly it's, uh, I think, still a, a message about uh, the importance of uh, manufacturing, the industrialization process. 
uh, these ones are really about the quality and the tech intensity um, of uh, manufacturing. So this is the, the share of medium and high tech uh, uh, manufacturing in value added. This is the share of medium and high tech uh, manufacturing in, in uh, exports. Um, so yeah, again, kind of broadly significant and uh, uh, of the expected sun. Human capital, a bit uh, misbehaving here. <laughs> As we often find, even in growth regressions, uh, people often find these weird results with uh, human capital. Um, it's supposed to be negative, <laughs> but is, is, is it's positive here and, uh, and, and significant. Uh, they're struggling with this one. Um, yeah, the, our, our, our global value chain measure, yeah, here it's negative and, uh, and, and significant. Uh, the FDI measure as well. This is also a bit of a strange one. The, the ones which uh, are not quite uh, behaving is the human capital and uh, gross fixed uh, capital formation. Um, here, of course, we will, we will expect it to be uh, uh, significant. I think it might be to do with kind of the, the quality, you know, the nature of investments, um, even though we'd still expect it to, to, to make an impact. But sometimes the composition of that investment and so on. Um, I think also in some of the developing countries, a lot of that investment is going into the mining sector, for example. Not that it's not going to, it's supposed to help with closing the gap, but it's not really maybe feeding into like structural change and so on. Yeah. So just some of the, the uh, observations bringing together the results. I think one is just around the kind of the complex, uh, multifaceted and heterogeneous uh, determinants of catching up. So although the results are, are broadly kind of, uh, as we expect and consistent with our hypotheses, it, it, they, they, they're quite mixed. And I think this also goes to this, the, the nature of the catching up process, right? It's not like a pot where you've got a, a fixed uh, recipe and you put in the ingredients, boom, there's the, uh, th there's the outcome. It's a multifaceted uh, process. You know, broadly, I think they still underscore the importance of uh, manufacturing for catching up, um, as well as the quality of manufacturing in terms of the technology intensity, the importance of strategically engaging with, uh, with uh, GVCs uh, that's captured by those GVC measures. Uh, the importance of, of uh, FDI came out, uh, you know, I guess more strongly even than what, what we've expected, seems to be part of those kind of learning bridges um, for, for uh, uh, middle income countries. Yeah, so uh, finally, just uh, bringing things together, and I'm almost done here, um, uh, from the different parts of the analysis in terms of policy implications. So I think, uh, yeah, the importance of um, aligning industrial policy um, with the evolving needs of industrial systems would be a different at different stages of, of, of development. And I think, not that middle income countries are kind of in a box by themselves and completely different, I mean, because it's uh, in income per capita is a spectrum, right? And these are kind of artificial uh, thresholds. But broadly, those kind of middle income countries, um, I think when those middle income countries have exhausted their traditional uh, developing country advantages, particularly in terms of uh, unit labor costs, and you kind of need more, you need tech intensity and so on, um, is where the, 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 the central role um, of, of government to step up uh, the industrialization push um, and to kind of grab hold of and climb the, the, the global uh, technology uh, ladder. Of, of course, here yeah, it's about what government should do. I implicit here is about uh, what government should not do. <laughs> I mean, because here yeah, it's about kind of what are the good things that you should do. Um, but as I said yesterday, if it's the wrong macroeconomic policy and so on, I mean, uh, you can have all of those uh, nice uh, innovation programs, technology programs, it's not going to take you anywhere with the, uh, with the wrong macro policy. Um, the importance of coordinating different institutions and levels of government. So again, uh, vertically between the national, provincial, uh, local, um, and horizontally. It's not, as I said yesterday, it's not just about Department of Trade and Industry. It's about uh, Treasury, it's about the Education Department, uh, Science, Technology, uh, Policy, and so on. And the political economy aspect of uh, the divergence of interests and uh, sometimes even different government departments kind of being uh, closer to different fractions of capital, financial, agricultural capital, and so on, and almost being uh, c captured by, by, by those, and that fragmentation uh, within government. Um, so I, I think coming back to those country cases, of course, in, in China, we see like the strongest coherence, even within the state, uh, in, in terms of policy and kind of 
all government departments pulling, not that there's not contestation, of course there was contestation, but pulling broadly in the, in the, in the same direction, industrialization and growth. Um, so there is considerable opportunity for upgrading in, 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 in value chains, and uh, as I said, I think the agro-processing one is, is an interesting one. Uh, not that uh, developing countries can put all of their industrialized efforts into, into that. Of course, they have auto uh, is essential, pharmaceuticals and so on. But even for low-income countries, I think it's one of those uh, viable value chains. Um, the importance of building the depth of uh, productive and technological capabilities to support um, innovation and upgrading, this linking up and linking back through, through the development and integration of uh, local production systems, um, including uh, technological update, upgrading as a basis for sustained uh, productivity growth. So I think, it, again, it comes back to you know, moving from middle to high income status. Of course, don't have austerity, don't have uh, crazy trade liberalization and so on. But there has to be there has to be more, and uh, I think it's uh, it's almost uh, impossible for a middle income country to move to a high income status, um, or you know, to sustain that and to graduate and stay there without uh, rapid technological progress. So all of these require um, industrial policies that are flexible and dynamic, uh, relevant for countries' own uh, political economy and other characteristics. Um, as we said. Have, have this notion of activity specificity and sector specificity. So focus on manufacturing, but also looking at those high productivity pockets, even in services and agriculture and so on. Um, seeing innovation and technological upgrading as, as part of industrial development. So still in some countries we have like, here's an industrial policy, here's a science, technology and innovation policy. It's different departments, it's different ministers, sometimes a little even uh, between them rather than seeing um, upgrading as kind of core to, to industrial policy. Um, I think this is my last slide here. Um, so industrial policies that champion uh, strategic engagement with some of the opportunities offered by global um, integration. So as I said, global value chains, they have those risks, but they have those opportunities for getting into, especially for, for low-income nascent industrialists, getting that, uh, th that uh, foothold. Uh, you know, it's, it's part of the prospects of escaping a middle-income trap, middle-income uh, technology trap. Um, and whilst, uh, as a stylized fact, um, most countries are remaining stuck in the middle, but the fact that countries have escaped, have moved up to high income, and in the case of China, w from low to low middle to upper middle, and uh, within a few years it's going to be high income, uh, very few years, it shows that it's possible. It's not like a death sentence to be, to be stuck there. Uh, it's about uh, you know, doing what, what, what is needed. Uh, yeah. um, context matters, and no one size fits all. Yes, but there also there are commonalities. So it's not about blueprints, but we also have to, have, have to learn from those uh, successful experiences. Yeah. Let me leave it there. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>
I would observe that uh, you spoke only of Embrapa. Embrapa was really fundamental. But for the manufacturing industry, uh, there was also the Bendes and the FINEP. Uh, these two institutions, uh, together with the, with the Ministry of uh, Science and Technology. That Embrapa also. Embrapa also. Ah, Embrapi. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, and these were very, very important. And uh, uh, I never studied su 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 very seriously this, th this problem of uh, technological development. I always uh, simplified the thing, saying that uh, 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 technological development depends on investment. Uh, and uh, if companies have no opportunity to invest for macro macroeconomic reasons, you know, then technological does not ha happen. No? Technology does, does not advance. But I, I, I understand that this is a partial vis vision. The, 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 the you have to have a larger vision about that. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I would urge to comment this because I am fully in agreement with your basic ideas, but uh, I thought that this would help. To Hi, Helen. Uh, uh, my question, I, I know that is uh, maybe a trick question, mm -hmm. but and feel free to answer the way you, the way you want to be. Do, um, uh, my question is about the role of the uh, let's say the national capital, not not the distinction between state capital, state the initiative is the, uh, uh, capital or not capital, but the state versus uh, private sector. But my question is within the private sector, the the role for national capital and international capital, because uh, if you look at the your, the results of your economic uh, uh, test, the most important uh, variable is G GVC, okay which it's, it's, a, wh wh it's a, wh where the international capital plays a, uh, a fundamental role. So I want to see your thoughts about this distinction of the role of national and international capital. Thanks, Fiona, for this great presentation. Two questions. You mentioned this briefly yesterday that uh, the limitations of policy space sometimes were overstated, but uh, uh, industrial policies often end creating disputes in the WTO. Where are the limits here? The second question is we have a huge revival of industrial policies in advanced economies since the outbreak of the Russian war against Ukraine uh, and the energy climate change issues. Is this an incentive for uh, middle-income countries so that they gain more legitimacy to do industrial policies or does it squeeze the space for industrial policies because of course the US industrial policies it's a very powerful instrument the European policies etc so how do you see that so Fiona let me ask you we have three more questions so I don't know if I can collect sure, sure. Uh, we, we also that. have a time constraints, so it, it would be great if we could uh, collect all, and then you... It's fine. Uh, first, congr first, congratulations for your excellent presentation again. Mm -hmm. So I have two comments. I don't know if it's a question, but if you want to comment, that's fine. So uh, when I, I, uh, I watch your presentation, so I think that there are two essential points for me there. One is the, the, the challenge. So there are lots of changes, exactly, but there are two essential th challenges for industrial policy. So uh, how to, to avoid the, the maquilas, or how to avoid the, the country to develop, but uh, just to be, just to stay on that part of that, just uh, that added a low value to 
manufacturing and so on. Okay, so the intermediate goods, yes, this is one problem for when you lost this this cha this this chain, okay, and then you lost your intermediate goods. So the your the linkage in back is as you said are terrible. So I don't know if it's too easy, but it's the problem. And the second is that Death Valley. I don't know if you said Death Valley. Yes, mm -hmm. it's a Death Valley. So how do you how to deal? And uh, if you saw the experience, how to deal? How to make those that link? It's essential, okay. In Brapa did it, but it's a specific case, okay, between the university research and the private sector research. So we must solve this valley if you want to to increase our technology here and uh, other developing countries. Yeah. I like very much uh, your presentation. I would just like to maybe make a suggestion for further consideration. It's that uh, I saw that in the econometric analysis, uh, gross capital formation wasn't significant. And my feeling is that it may be, on the contrary, may, may be key to these processes. Because even when a great part of literature talks about increasing productivity, if we squeeze to the the core of it, uh, I believe that we're talking about investment. Mm -hmm. Because be it the effect of on investment on the specific form, be on externalities, uh, investment is one of the main leverage for, for productivity. And also because looking in the case of Brazil, the last time Brazil had a, a successful growth, it was from 2004 to 2014, you know, graphic was when it, it, it touched the, mm -hmm. the high income uh, threshold. Uh, what happened there was that during those 10 years, gross capital formation as a percentage of GDP was growing. And another thing that also happened there was that there was a, a very consistent expansion of credit and partially of ki a credit kind of related to technology, as, as uh, Marconi mentioned, FINEP, which is very specific to technology, but also BNDS because it's, it's linked to investment. And normally when you make a new investment, you have new technology embedded, apart from the ex typical externalities when investment is in infrastructure. So I think that looking at what happens to gross capital formation may be one of the key issues and maybe the econometrics doesn't mm -hmm. always get it sometimes other variables to take the, that effect and also I, I i thought about it also because of the case of china in which one of the uniqueness of china is the huge percentage of investment as a percentage of G gdp right so just this comment thank you primary education of sustainable or of uh, employment or uh, population better than the revenue. Just, just a quick question, Fiona. I liked very much your presentation. My question is, uh, if you've looked into the complexity index with from this perspective of the middle income trap, because uh, as far as I know, it's very easy to see in the index the middle income trap there. It's very quantified in a sense because we have, essentially we have like 120 countries and the rich ones, they have a threshold of, of economic complexity index above one. Mm -hmm. And f the middle income trap is from zero to one. That's the world of Maquilas, Brazil, Turkey, uh, uh, and many. Brazil is a Maquila country from that perspective, yeah. Especially Zona Franca de Manaus is the best case of, of Maquila that I've, that I've ever known. It's the worst case of Maquila because it's, it's geared toward the inside, not the outside. So it's, it's, it's even worse than the Mexican Maquila. It's the worst case of Maquila. And poor countries are below zero. So it's a very easy way to, 
to quantify that. Um, and I, I was wondering what the results would be if we use this kind of analysis, just that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, yes, yeah. th 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 these are great questions uh, and, and comments. So th th thanks so much for the for the engagement. Um, I'll try and answer them quickly because of time. Uh, let me start with uh, Professor Bresser, um, even though it was uh, mostly comments. But uh, your, your your comment on uh, that uh, yes, Imbrapa uh, is, is just one example uh, for, for sure. And and I think in our choice of uh, case studies. It's not to, to suggest that this is the core industrial policy of, of a country. It was more just choosing some diverse examples um, from, from the three uh, countries. If, uh, if we had to say, what is the emblematic, emblematic uh, example of industrial policy in Brazil? We're not going to choose uh, in Brapa. Um, but it's just to, to show the diversity by sector and by, by instrument and, 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 and so on. Um, your other two questions, let me, let me um, combine them. Uh, your, your comment about China, yes. I, I, also myself, I was interested and uh, surprised to find how early China had done these, uh, th th these policies. The 1980s, uh, it, 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 children in China were still not having uh, enough uh, food to eat, right? <laughs> I mean, not all, but some, yeah? But they were looking at uh, uh, putting money to high tech, right? So I think, you know, one of the broader lessons from this is in the, in the let's say, upgrading and catching up process. Yes, you can leapfrog, but a lot of it is just uh, hard work <laughs> and incremental changes and so on. Not to say that you can't leapfrog and you have to follow a linear path and so on, but in, in, in China, yes, it's a Merkel, but it's, it, it's also an investment over decades in these kinds of uh, capabilities. It's not that somebody now has just decided, oh, let me like, uh, start to use a robot or produce a robot or whatever, um, learning, and I'm, I'm not talking about learning in the school, learning in firms and uh, as part of the industrialization process, learning by doing. Uh, it, it happens over, uh, over time. And I think relating th with this with your question or, or your comment rather about kind of how to locate, if I can put it differently, how to locate technological change in the structural change and, and uh, structural transformation and catching up process. Is it something that you kind of, you, you, you grow and it will come, <laughs> or to what extent it's, a, it's an ingredient, a purposive ingredient in that process. Um, and I think, I mean, even in, uh, reflecting on your question in terms of my own kind of intellectual uh, uh, development on, 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 on this, um, I think previously I wasn't focusing as much on these issues of innovation, uh, technology, and so on. But I think increasingly, like, we, we can recognize that, yes, if you're going fast, uh, firms will do it more. But it's not, it's not enough just to have it as a responsive thing, right? Um, and part of that is that there are externalities, positive externalities from innovation and from uh, technological change. So f and firms will underinvest in it as part of that. Uh, they will, from a structural change perspective, firms will underinvest in it. And when they do invest, there are these positive uh, spillovers on other firms for the industrialization and structural change process. So the fact that there are externalities and that there's an underinvestment is part of the case for saying the state must do, uh, must do more. Um, and I guess, uh, yeah, maybe this links as well with, um, okay, let me just uh, maybe take them, uh, yeah. Um, let me maybe go to the next one, which was from yourself around the role of uh, national and international uh, capital. Um, so I think both are important, and it's not, uh, it's more about the, the nature of articulation between them, right? Uh, if we're talking about multinationals, uh, the banana company or whatever, you know, the, the classic uh, critiques of uh, multinationals from the, the Caribbean or something, that's not the kind of uh, uh, FDI that's going to take you forward, um, right? So it's about attracting FDI, which ideally has higher levels of productivity and technology than in the domestic economy. So it's not just about FDI that will create some jobs and generate some forex. Yeah, it's important. But it's, it's about having those linkages also with domestic firms. So this is the kind of the linking back. It's not just in the value chains, but even when you've got that FDI, how do you learn from that? How do you ensure there's technology transfer and skills uh, transfer and so on? Um, and so I, I think, is it, yeah, so it's, a, it's about maybe that mode of articulation between uh, national and international uh, capital. Um, yeah, but th thanks for your questions. 
Um, so in terms of the industrial policy space, I guess is what you're, you're, you're asking about. Um, so th there's no doubt that uh, the WTO and the rules from that ha have restricted some of the policy space and industrial policy that was there previously. And that's why it's important for countries like Brazil, South Africa and so on, to be contesting that at the, at the international level. So, th so for sure some of that space is, is, is restricted. Um, but there's still a lot of space. Uh, and sometimes even critics of industrial policy domestically will be, oh, no, we can't do this because of uh, WTO or whatever. <laughs> but yes, the, the, you know, there, is, there is still space. An interesting point uh, which you were raising around kind of the re renewal and the mainstream of, of industrial policy, let's say in the US or whatever, is it good or bad for developing countries? I, I guess you were arguing that does this revival of industrial policy uh, kind of uh, squeeze the space for industrial production in uh, developing countries? I think I hadn't really thought about it in, in that way because the U.S. never stopped doing industrial policy, right? <laughs> um, they might not have uh, talked about it and had a document written industrial policy, but they never stopped doing industrial policy. Um, and even as much as they deindustrialized, we know the rust belts of Detroit and so on, but it still it was a, a manufacturing uh, superpower. Never stopped that, right? So I think it, it's not about kind of having our space uh, squeezed uh, by that but looking at how can we also, where there is a uh, industrial production there, how can we link up with that as uh, suppliers and so on. So again, it's about the strategic uh, integration in the global value chains. Um, uh, you know, Nelson, how to avoid um, Makela's. Um, what did I write here? Growth, uh, growth gone wrong again. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, th I think it's about, it's, it's not only maquilas like as an, an EPZ in, uh, in Mexico where you've got like a zone or, or whatever. It's about the mode of production, right? Um, and, and avoiding just being at that uh, assembly stage. Um, and I think again, this goes to the growth pulling of manufacturing. Um, and what we were talking about yesterday, like that manufacturing has this enduring role today even of an engine of growth. But if you run some uh, cross-country regressions, you know, you're modeling determinants of growth and you put their manufacturing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. It's gonna, you know, you'll get some kind of mixed results and over time it looks like it's weaker. And part of that I think goes to this quality of manufacturing, right? You might have your manufacturing uh, looking high in your national accounts, but if it's just like uh, putting TVs together or, or uh, putting some garments uh, together, it's not having that uh, engine of growth as a, that, that the, the structuralist uh, tradition has always been uh, talking about, right? And then, of course, it's not going to show up as a, uh, in, in a growth-pulling uh, way. Um, so I think even in your industrial policy incentives, it's about how do you incentivize certain types of manufacturing? And uh, again, like linking back to you know, the, what, what I was talking about yesterday, it's not just like, okay, here's manufacturing, but it's about the technology level, the subsector, and, and so on. So even when you're designing those industrial policy incentives, it's not just, okay, if you do any manufacturing, yeah, here's some money, right? Mm -hmm. It's about how do you incentivize uh, the right uh, types of, of, uh, of manufacturing. Um, in, in terms of uh, gross uh, fixed capital formation, yes, I fully agree with you. Uh, I mean, to be honest, whatever uh, econometric regressions uh, show is not going to change my mind. <laughs> um, even if I can run one million regressions, it's not significant. It's gonna, not going to change my mind about the, the, the fundamental importance of it. Um, and even as a, as a kind of policy mix and in the development process, yes, you can have a whole lot of incentives. You can talk about innovation you know, and have R&D and so on. Unless you've got your gross fixed capital formation being a significant share of GDP, uh, you're not going to go anywhere. And like, I think it comes back as well to micro and macro. That we, 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 uh, I think you were not here yesterday, but we were talking about that articulation between micro and macro. It's conceptually, but also in terms of policy, right? Uh, you've got to have the macro policy that will uh, enable uh, you to, to grow that share. But at the, at the end of the day, also, that, sh that gross fixed capital formation uh, as a share of GDP, it's an aggregation of what's happening at, at, at firms, right? So I think it's about that, uh, that kind of articulation. Um, the complexity measure, I think we tried this, uh, Danilo. Yeah, um, uh, Paolo, uh, because obviously it would have been one of the, the choice uh, variables. I think that we didn't have enough uh, data coverage, right, to restrict the, the sample too much. But conceptually, it would, have be, it would be a good way of, uh, of, of uh, measuring this. Yeah, unfortunately, the data is not enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it restricted the sample, yeah.
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry to end this very good uh, presentation. Uh, let's do 10 minutes coffee break and then we start the parallel sessions. Yeah, 10 minutes. It's in the uh, 12th Twelve floor. Uh, th 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 10 minutes of coffee and then we go up to the, to the room. Yeah.